everybody, and uh, thank you for being here, for sharing with us all these experiences. Our next panel, like we just heard from Gil, is a huge topic, I would say. We have war, peace, we have sacrifice and sustainability, so it's a massive topic for quite a short time and for us here on stage, but we will do our best to hopefully give you a very interesting discussion and the very least to show you the very different obstacles these people here on stage face in the very different aspects of their companies. We have, we live in very challenging times. Um, we have obviously an increasing international divide we have to fight with. We have environmental degradation. We have a loss of biodiversity. Everything is accelerating. The earth is heating up. It's going more and more downhill. We've had huge plans. 2019, the EU had the Green Deal. Then the pandemic hit. Everything was kind of put on the back burner. Now, the war has disrupted the global trade once again after it just had like a slight comeback after the pandemic. And we have food and energy prices that are soaring. We have famine. We have material shortage. We have everybody's talking about recession. And um, I think all this, all these crises have really highlighted how fragile our international trade and world really is and how what dangers globalization and what challenges it can actually bring. So for me, the interesting fact is how can we still have sustainability at the top of our list? How can we still put that on a priority? I know in a lot of companies, you know, it's the sustainability programs are the cost centers of the businesses. So in an environment where cost saving and layoffs are the norm, how do we, how do we not prioritize our bottom lines? for the future of the planet. So that would be the first question I would throw at you guys. Ulrike, I'm just going to say ladies first. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Nina, and hello, everyone. Um, well, I think we've moved on uh, to some degree from the idea that sustainability is just a cost center. Uh, actually, at Henkel, we positioned it right in the center of our business growth strategy, by the way, together with digitalization and innovation. So these are the main drivers for competitive edge. And so far, I feel very comfortable here. Um, and that is not, well, why is that so? It's essentially because the consumers want more sustainable products. Customers are asking us to help them achieve their sustainability targets. By the way, job seekers today are looking for companies that address their values and are really driving sustainability as well there. So it's also, it's really a competitiveness, talent, uh, and future play for us and for companies now. So I think it's moved on from that. But it doesn't mean that sustainability doesn't cost money. It needs investment, and I think that's where the current cost squeezes, the recession, the issues that we have around the supply chain disruptions <coughs> are really limiting the ability of some companies mm -hmm. to think long term, to invest long term, to have the financial ability to go that way. And I think that's what we need to look out for. How do we enable ourselves as an economy, as a society, as companies to actually take that step regardless? Um, and so, so I think that's where the discussion is right now. I'm just going to jump to Google. Uh, basically, one could say, you know, Henkel has had the shortages now in war of the supply chain, et cetera. You supposedly are the big winners of this, these last couple of times. The pandemic has really, you know, pushed the technology sector. Everybody's kind of become dependent on your solutions. How is this working out for you? Yeah, at, at Google, we think that technology can and, and actually must be part of the solution. And um, we just actually yesterday, here in our Berlin office had the very first Google uh, Climate Summit in Berlin where we discussed the role of technology um, to protect the climate change or to, to, to fight against the climate change. And we had a um, very deep discussion. Um, what are sort of the elements that are missing? What are the things that we can do? And, you know, for us, it's not something that we just started a few years ago. Um, sustainability and our commitment to be um, carbon neutral goes all the way back to the founding um, times of our company. And before I joined in 2008, one year before, Larry and Sergey, our founders, basically said, Google will be a carbon neutral company. And we've come a long way with technology. We are actually 100% CO2 neutral since 2017. And our big goal is that by 2030, we will be 
um, completely net zero emissions for the entire um, uh, scope that we have, including scope three, which is the supply chain. Um, and we're in a very, very good um, trajectory there. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately, a lot of people are using our products to make um, the right decisions. Every decision counts. And if you go to Google Maps and you look for a route and we offer you a more sustainable route, then you know, most likely you will actually consider it. And that's sort of the nudging into the right direction. Or if you do a Google search about a product and we tell you, hey, this product is the same cost, but it has um, you know, more sustainability for whatever um, attributes. Um, and that is really where the scale is. We have billions of users, and if we can enable them to <coughs> make informed decisions for a more sustainable future, I think that's super valuable. Patrick, the energy sector has obviously really been hit through this war, through these times we're living in. I think E.ON has had a huge change since 2014. You know, you've really switched the company around. Now, you've had these last years where you, again, had to face all these challenges, which maybe weren't necessarily on the top of your list of like, oh, this is what we're going to deal with. How did you cope with the last couple of years, and how are you continuing on your path? Yeah, I mean, nobody wants uh, the pandemic, uh, nor does anybody want the war. Uh, um, everybody wants the peace for this panel. So, you know, we have the responsibility to deliver electricity, gas, and that's uh, green gas to 51 million customers around Europe, and we actually connect even more. Um, we already made a change, so back to your first question, you know, we are green, we do nothing else than green, and we put all the solutions together um, to make sure we can deliver all this green energy, but also keep people connected and actually keep the society going. Um, we really saw that the markets exploded, uh, so that was uh, actually not nice if you have to pay for the, for the energy, obviously. But on the other hand, markets do function, which is a very good point in all of this. I think also, when we made the switch already long ago, and the, and the, the path we actually set in, you know, we are gaining momentum, and we do this not alone. We do this, of course, with partners. Uh, Google is also one of our partners, if we have many more partners in technology. Because I think my point is that we can't master this transition where we go from a functioning society based on fossil to a green energy one without actually doing a European thing, getting the companies together, getting the people together, getting the governments together, and also make sure we set the framework for it. Because now we have a framework, either in law or permits or whatever, which is completely based on fossil energy. And I think we need to get away from that much more ahead of the wave. And that's why we're working on uh, day and night, more or less, uh, with the colleagues here. Um, and we are rather successful, and I, I see a tremendous growth in front of us, but we have, like you said, the, the real uh, uh, challenge on resources, people, skilled people who want to come and work with us, who deliver stuff. And now with the econ economy you're talking about, is let's say the interest rate is going up. We just heard the finance minister of, of Germany. Yeah. Luckily, he came because I think that's also a bit of a spanner in the works where money was for free, and now we're up, and you see the United States actually lowering the interest rate by not raising it, but that's really what it is. And the IRA, which talked uh, uh, Lindner as well about, we desperately need in Europe a BRA, which is the Bureaucracy Reduction Act. And I think that will really speed things uh, ahead tremendously. Carl, um, I think it's an incredible complex task for your organization as well. I think 3,600 companies in Europe alone. How are, what is happening? I mean, the last, years have been quite complicated, I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really know where to start or stop with you. Uh, probably neither do you. But what would you see as your biggest challenges? And do you actually see these companies staying on the path? Well, let me ask you uh, a few words on, on um, who, who am I representing? You know, everybody knows Google. Most people know Henkel. Some people even might know Eon. Nobody knows <laughs> us. So what is this guy doing on stage here? Um, basically, um, I represent uh, the equipment um, and machine manufacturers in Germany and in Europe. Um, this is a large industry uh, measured by employees. It's the largest industrial employer in Europe. One million people in Germany, four million people in Europe. And it's a vast amount of medium-sized family-owned businesses, small businesses, 150, 230 people, somewhere in the wilderness of Germany or Austria or northern Italy. Um, but these people and these companies, they do a lot of niche technologies which enable exactly the transformation we are talking about. There was a very interesting uh, study by Boston Consulting Group, BCG, uh, one and a half years ago, uh, which showed that the 
technologies that we represent are able to reduce 86%, 86% of CO2 emissions, but are only contributing 2%. And there is no other industry that, that I know that has this beautiful relation of positive impact on the one side and very few negative output um, on the other side. So it's kind of an enabling industry. And this is why we believe um, we talk a lot more about chances here than about risks. For me, it's the very first time on, on the Green Tech Festival. I really like the name, Green Tech. I believe we can only be green through technology. But in the last two years, I mean, as I just said, we are actually, you're now, you all gave very positive aspects of how you are changing. What are the sacrifices you had to make? What were the challenges of the last time? Because you all, it, now it sounded very positive through the bank here. It's incredible to say, you know, 86%, but is that actually possible? Have most of these middle class companies, have they suffered through supply chain shortages? How are they set up? Are there big changes happening? Well, yes, there are changes happening, but there are always changes happening. I think we have uh, too much of a negative picture um, on uh, the state of the economy and uh, especially on the state um, of the industry. Most of the companies are doing well because the setbacks that we have seen are compensated also by positive chances that we see. If you look at the huge public spending um, packages that we see, whether it's the IRA uh, um, uh, in the US, whether uh, these are programs that we see in the EU, there's so much spending in transformation technologies, and we participate in these markets. So there have been setbacks. We're going through super challenging times. Eon maybe a little bit more than me. Um, but however, um, things are not as bad as they seem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, you asked for the sacrifice, and I think 1,000 kilometer more east, a lot of people are sacrificing a lot for their freedom, which we yes. all have here. And we can talk about you know, being green and, and all the good stuff. I think there is a very big item which is sacrifice. It's not only sustainable energy, and actually access to energy is affordability. Mm -hmm. And if you look at just autonomous world, Joe Sixpack, if you look at the bill they used to pay, and where it is now, it's four or five times higher. And then the government helps a bit, but no government in the world can subsidize for a very long time the energy price at this level to bring it down. Yeah. Because in even a very rich country, richest country maybe, Germany is going to suffer a lot, and people were spending already 8% of their net, net income on energy, so we need to make sure they produce themselves, and we make, need to make sure those prices that you know, go down by getting more supply, but we're now playing as Europe on a global front. We not have Russia gas anymore, we have gas from all over the world, therefore the global context plays into that, and the only way out of that is accelerating make sure we use less energy and if we use this green so we actually get more green energy with the people at home and also everywhere where we can actually produce it. So I think that's a big sacrifice, not only on affordability, but sometimes we need to sacrifice also your backyard. So people cannot say, I like green energy, but not in my backyard mm. or not anywhere near me. I've heard <laughs> banana, I heard uh, uh, already. And I mean, that's really interesting to talk about that as a sacrifice, because if we really want to continue with the society we have here, we need to sacrifice maybe one thing that we can always say, uh, you know, I don't want it here, but I need green energy. The one doesn't go without the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm a kind of person, and we like to be a kind of company that sees the glass half full rather than half empty, so, and there's no choice, right? There's no point in, uh, in being depressed, as we discussed earlier. But also fair to say, Henkel had to deal with an additional 2 billion euros of material cost last year. So you have to, that, you know, that's the reality. You have to deal with that. that. That is going to drive certain decisions, in particular around efficiencies, integration of businesses. Some of that needed to be done anyway. Um, so it's not necessarily bad, but it's, it's simply a reality. On the other side, uh, even though these pressures are existing, and, and of course they have been large extent existing because of the war, uh, we've also moved and given up our business in Russia. Uh, we've actually, this April this year, we finally concluded a transaction. Uh, our hearts are bleeding because we've invested in that country, in our people, our assets for 30 years. But it is a fact of life. So again, that is another, um, another impact that we have to deal with. But despite that, we continue to invest behind sustainability. Mm -hmm. 
We had, on the back of a, a big power purchasing agreement in the US, we concluded one for Europe that really will cover for the next years our electricity uh, supply, renewable electricity supply for entire Europe. We are now at 70% renewable electricity worldwide for all we need. We also went into very strategic partnerships, including with our supplier and partner BSF, to explore renewable carbon in chemical ingredients, so really to replace the fossil carbon in the chemical ingredients that we use for some of our consumer products. So really big bets on the future, mm -hmm. despite uh, all those pressures. And of course, we also see some positives, right? So glass half full again. You know, if you are diversifying the supply chain, if you're finding new sourcing routes, if you're going into new technologies and innovations, you're also making yourself more resilient. You have more choices, you go further, and frankly, those two gentlemen here are really my friends because without you know, renewable electricity, we can't make it. Without digitalization and data, we can't make it either. So that's again to the point of collaboration as well. Mm -hmm. and, you and, you, and you don't get your toothpaste and not without, into machines. It without the respective machine. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> and, yeah, and, and you know, I very much agree with what Ulrich has said. Um, and I want to make three points. One is I think talking about it as sacrifice is the wrong framing. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, we've heard. Um, in our conference yesterday, but also this morning on stage, that uh, you know that doesn't help. It's not a solution to talk about sacrifices, and uh, and in fact, in many cases, it's not a sacrifice. It's just you need to have the information to make the right decision, and then it's not a sacrifice. And well, uh, and can it be a catalyst? Yeah. You know, can this crisis be a catalyst for exactly. change? Exactly. So, so that's number one. Number two, and and you said that as well. Um, you know, this is all sort of a data-driven approach. And if you use the right data, and I always like to say the, the climate change is the biggest IT project of all times. Um, and, and if you use the data to make the right decision, which we've done in our data centers for two decades now, and we're at a point where um, our efficiency in the data center is, there's a term that's called power usage efficiency, PUE. We're at 1.06, which means there's only 6% overhead for cooling and, and lighting and what have you, um, and the rest goes into compute power, which is twice as effective at, as the industry standard for, for all data centers. So moving your workloads into the cloud is not only more sustainable, it's also more secure and all that, but that is something that doesn't actually is any sacrifice. It's just the right decision to make. Um, and then maybe the last point, we also published a report yesterday. We call that the Digital Decarbonization Report. Um, for Germany, which showed that with digital technology alone, we can actually save 20 to 25 percent of carbon emissions in Germany in the four main sectors that we see. A lot of it includes what, what Kurt is representing, um, and, and that is 150 to 180 megatons of COT, CO2 emissions in Germany alone. So I think l let's try to frame it in a positive way not talk about sacrifices, because nobody wants to make sacrifices, be honest. Um, but this is also not a question of whether or not. Right? We, we have no choice. And who listened to Johan Rockström this morning, I think, um, understood that this is not a goal. He framed it very nicely. It's not a goal. This is, this is you know, a must-meet um, the 1.5% the, the and 1.5 degree uh, that, we, that we have in front of us. And you know, I, I, think, I think it makes sense to, to talk about the mindset, sacrificing and gaining. What do we sacrifice and what do we gain? And, and I made a beautiful experience just today, uh, which, I would, which I would like to, to share yeah. with everybody listening here. So let's suppose Robert Habeck, our famous minister of climate and economy, he walks in and he says, from tomorrow onward, you have to brush your teeth without water. <laughs> Who would consider this as a sacrifice? Be honest. From tomorrow onwards, you have to brush your teeth without water. Who would consider this to be a sacrifice? We have a startup outside that actually does that. And now you go 50 meters this direction, and there's a small little startup called Natch, and they'll show you how to brush your teeth without water, and it feels great. <laughs> I just did it on the booth, and it's amazing. So I think um, we sacrifice something, we gain something else. And uh, a more serious example uh, for me is um, individual car-based mobility. Naturally, individual car-based mobility will be reduced, specifically in metropolitan areas. Now we can say, oh, 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 we sacrifice this individual car-based mobility, but we could also say we gain other forms of mobility that might be attractive as well. 
Well, and you gain the entire surrounding. I mean, especially this whole discussion about cities, you really have to say what you gain from clean air, from, you know, leisure places, just the whole living experience. Why do people move outside of cities to have more greenery, to have more relaxed, more less noise? And if you get that into the cities, that could be a huge plus. So that's the gain you have. What is something, like, like we just said, the gain? What is your hopeful future outlook at E.ON? What do you... Where are you striving to? What do you say? You know, I really believe we can accomplish that in the next couple of years, even though we are facing the challenging times we have today. Well, I, we, we really are gunning for uh, let's say, connecting all our customers, which are over 50 million in Europe, to green energy by uh, 2035. We have a huge investment uh, program for it, you know, easily north of 40 billion and accelerating it because there is so much work coming to us away. Um, so, That's all great. We have a lot of great, uh, great grow organizations which are doing that. Yeah, and it's not going all be linear because there are going to be things in your path you have to deal with. So that's actually looking forward to as well because I think the journey is going to be enormously exciting. And we talk really easily about the end game where we really want to go, but it's going to be also challenging. And, I, and again, like I said, you cannot do this alone. And we have to do yeah. it really with a lot of partners because it's going to be such a huge thing If all my customers would say today, yes, I want to be green this year, I cannot promise them that. It's impossible. Yeah. So we really have to make that journey, and I think that's going to be terrific. It's going to be a whole new industry. And I, that, you know, if we are properly business managing our company and do it in a healthy way with frugality and cost optimizations and growth perspective, then we are in play to be a really great company. If we don't manage the company good, then we will be suffering with a lot of new entrants will be coming as well. So it keeps you on your toes as well, which I believe is, is pivotal to be successful. Well, and probably also to diversify. Isn't that also the main... I always feel in the energy sector, we are very much going... We're always trying to go in one direction. And I do think that to diversify, I come for more from farming, actually, from agriculture. And it's always a stable farm, something that really gets you through the crisis, is always a farmer who diversifies. And the second you go on one technology and forget about the rest, you kind of fall off the wagon. Well, I think the larger framing um, of your question is, is how technology open are we, uh, or how destined uh, are we to follow just one technology path? And you may not be surprised, um, representing an industry which is so highly diversified, that one of my key pleas uh, um, uh, to the political sphere is let the swarm intelligence of all of these companies, of these engineers, of these knowledgeable people, let the swarm intelligence do the race in a free mode and best solutions will be produced. Mm -hmm. So that is what you, the policy you're, or what you're hoping yes, from mean, the political right now, leaders. We, we see so much legislation which is defining a technology path yes. where Uh, let's say a relatively small group of people believe this is the right path and we have to go and we put that into a European or into a German law instead of making incentives, creating incentives and then let people decide what is the smartest way. I completely agree. Ulrike? Well, your hopes five and years, your yeah. Well, in the current circumstances and given we're on a panel with a title like this, I think we have to emphasize the absolute importance of peace and stable democracies, because unless we have peace and stable democracies, we're not even talking about sustainability, right? But over with that assumption done, um, I'd say two things. In five years, we are just before 2030, which is mm -hmm. the eponymous uh, watershed where we really have to turn the curves down. And so by then, I A, want that a lot of those great innovations and technologies that we see here actually have fully commercialized, scaled, and are actually state of the art and are moving forward. That we are seeing a pathway for breakthrough technologies for the next decade that really get us to net zero and how we're actually going to get those to market and to scale. We need to know that by then. And me personally, frankly, I hope that we've gotten through the squeeze point of investing a lot of resources that we do right now, a lot of time in re reporting and disclosures and seemingly administrative work so that the disclosure, the, the transparency that we'll have reached at that point will actually help us to make better and more effective decisions. So right now it feels very hard, but in five years, touch wood, we might have gotten to a better place. And I think Google has huge goals as well. Net zero by 230. 
Yeah, so I think the science is clear and, uh, and, and everyone knows it. I also think that um, we now all realize and know that we have the tools available to solve that challenge. Um, we also know from, from the data that it's possible. So really what's left is that everyone actions on it. And um, uh, Robert Habeck yesterday said, it's called climate action and not climate sit around and wait. And, and I think that's bringing it to the point. And all the innovators that we have here at the Green Tech Festival are showing that it's possible. Um, we also are a very open platform oriented company um, and we offer tools, transparency, data um, and algorithms um, with our AI solutions to actually tackle some of the toughest problems out there um, in a very efficient environment already. Um, so we're here to help as a partner. We want to enable everyone to make informed decisions um, because every decision counts, really every decision counts. Um, and, and hopefully together we can turn this thing around. Um, there's nothing that speaks against it but us. <laughs> well, and I think on a topic where, you know, a long time people have been saying the environmental crisis is so hard for the human race to tackle because it's this far off distance thing. We are getting, we're at the tipping points. And my only hope now is that because basically shit is hitting the fan, yep. all of us are finally going to speed up and are going to get our act together. And I'm very thankful all of you are doing your very best. And thank you very much for being here on this panel and for having this discussion and for actually thinking about solutions and how we can gain something through the sacrifices we've made and how this crisis can actually maybe push us forward instead of slowing us down again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.